time for Tuesday Night Live Chat with Brian S. Red and John Young. Good evening and welcome to Tuesday Night with Ben Stowe. Oops. Oops. Dang. Dang. Got me and Stowe. I thought, Remember me, guys? Well, we'll do, we'll do something different. We'll do something different, but we need to make sure we use the, the phrase, it depends, multiple times. Well, it depends. Uh, <laughs> it depends if we want to do the... T- uh, good evening and welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight out there on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, Brian Red is with me tonight. Uh, we haven't had a chance to do a show in a long time because it's just been crazy with family and doing yeah. this and sports and things. And the seasons of... I'm kind of in a break here, so it's like let's let's get together and do a show on a Tuesday night. And and for those of you who follow the uh, music Tuesday night music show uh, with uh, Jay and and Howie and Brian, they're going to be doing that after we get done with our live show that's going out right now. You go to djntv.com slash chill, and you'll be able to uh, kind of watch the recording of that. And then uh, that show gets put up uh, put up uh, about eventually. A and, yeah, about a week and a half later is when uh, the shows get put up. So yeah, that way, uh, that's the way it goes. So. So, so Brian, it's great to be back and, and uh, have some thank time. You. So thanks for thanks coming Thanks for on. having me on. I, yeah. I miss you. I miss doing shows with you. <laughs> Who is that guy? <laughs> oh, oh, you're funny. You're funny. Oh, I should open the chat. I forgot about that. They yeah. like chat this. Yeah, okay, they're, cool. they're, there's actually the actually chat and they're going pretty good. Pretty good. So. Nice. So there's, a, there's a variety of different things I wanted to cover tonight. Because, um, yes. you know, first off, you were you were really busy. So we want to talk about the weekend in which you were going to, you were performing all weekend. Um, yeah. And, and, all, well, all week. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much all week. Uh, with, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I wanted to talk um, as part of that um, about ch- training people. Mm. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit. And then I want to bring up Festivus. So those are going to be kind of our topics for tonight. We'll talk about the the big uh, the big week of uh, work, training people, and then festivals. Sure. So, sure. So first off, uh, for those who haven't been following and such, you um, ended up last week going to down to where was that down in Florida? Daytona Beach, Florida. Yeah. And and kind of or give the, us a, yeah a little a little what what you're doing down there. Well, it was the Welcome to Rockville Festival. It's four days of music starting at around noon going till midnight or 1 30 or whatever and the backstory to this is i was asked by a gentleman i went to school with high school with <laughs> uh, to design a system that would allow a person to not only do karaoke but to provide backing tracks for up and coming artists to sing. Sure. So if there was, let's say a country artist who had a new track, they had a backing track, you could load it into a program or something, play it so they could perform it live. So I told my friend, I said, look, understand that I, I don't do karaoke, but I understand how these systems work. It's pretty much a DJ system, you know, simplified as far as, you know, the, the controller and jog wheels and such go mm-hmm. with a microphone mixer. I think that would probably be the easiest path forward. He says, well, we need you to, to design this system so we can train anyone to use it. I said, well, I'm not sure how easy it will be, but I'll make it as simple as I can. Sure. So, so I built the system to his wishes and I did show him some of the equipment that I had on me at the time in my truck because I was doing all my weddings at the time. I had the Evolve 30Ms I, and he was thinking, you know, we'll put some some JBLs. We've got some JBL Eon stuff that we use and they work really well. I said, well, can I show you something? So I took the Evolve 30Ms into the conference room and, and put on like a Bluetooth XM thing. And cranked it up and I was talking to him. I said, you notice how we can hear each other? He's like, oh, that's amazing. I'm like, yeah, but it's loud. I said, I think this would work really well for what you want to do. The, I guess little marquee or tent or whatever was about an 80 person capacity situation. So I thought this would be ideal. Sure. The system, if, if you see it, and, and I'm posting a video soon. I'm, I'm in the editing process of it right now. It looks a lot like my DJ system. Because everything that I was showing him was stuff that I just happened to have. Yeah. And and he liked it and it was practical and it worked. So yeah. 
that's not my equipment that you're seeing in the video. That's actually stuff that I I was able to source locally, a lot of it locally, and uh, put together for for the client. Brian, let's but anyway. Let's, I, let's, I'm, let's hang I'm on sorry. right there for just a second. Um, sure. You 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 mentioned, of course, the Evolve Thirty. Why did you go thirty instead of the fifty? What was your rationale behind that? Well, I've I own both, mm -hmm. and I've been using the thirty pretty much exclusively since I got them which was during the pandemic. I think they came actually were shipped around May perhaps. And I had just a few gigs in 2020, but I used those because the events were much smaller. We were doing, you know, half capacity yeah. at best. So a hundred people was like a big event, right? Mm -hmm. And they worked wonderful. And I'm to the point where I kind of prefer them for this, for any, anything under 150 people. I want to use the 30 M's, the, the fifties, there's nothing wrong with the fifties, but I prefer the 30 M's. I think they, they sound really nice. Do, the, do you feel that there's a lot of sound fall off or, or sound uh, you're lacking sound from those compared to the fifties? No, no, no. In fact, and it may just be perception, but I think the 30 M's sound better. Hmm. There's Dynacorn amps in there. I, they, it, it's it's good stuff. So not as big, but I prefer them. Hmm. And when we were talking about only 80 people, why run 50s? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because you know, I, I, the way I'm looking at it right now, my go-to speakers are the the Evolve 50s and the Evolve 30 amps. If I have over, well, okay, let's put it this way: if I have close to 200 people, I'm bringing the 50s. And I mean, if I'm going above and beyond like two and a quarter, I need something more than that. But for around two, I think the fifties are fine for the types of things I do and for my sound objectives, right. but for anything less than 150, there's no reason to bring those. You can bring the 30 M's. They weigh less. And I think they sound fantastic. I like that you use this sound, the, the phraseology for sound objectives, because I think yes. that's a big, big thing. And I think that's an important thing because not only do we have our objectives of what we want to do sound wise, but the clients are going to have an expectation and an objective. And sometimes Correct. what we think I need big bass isn't what the clients and, and you right. gave a great example of that when you're standing there talking to the person while the uh, speakers are playing. Yeah, and it made a difference because mm -hmm. there, the well, the client ultimately was Swisher Sweets, the cigars, and they were carding people, they were signing them up for mailing lists and all of those kind of things, kind of right in front of the system. And if we would have had a two-way top cabinet with with a horn just just blaring, nobody would have been able to hear. Like, they wouldn't have been able to have a conversation with clients. They wouldn't right. have been able to take their information or talk to them at all where this was ideal. They could hear it fine, good and clear, but it wasn't blowing anybody's head off. And I like that for weddings too, especially weddings, because, I mean, people go to weddings and they see people they haven't seen in a long time. They want to have conversations. Mm -hmm. So there's two things that I feel like that you don't want to do. You don't want to exhaust people from screaming at each other over the sound. And you absolutely don't want to chase them out of the room to have a conversation because then you lose your audience. Do you find, we've talked about this on past shows when we've been together, mm -hmm. a listener fatigue. Yes. Do you find that that is a, a thing at all when you're dealing with the Evolve? No, it's not a thing. Uh, in, in fact, it's... So, okay. What I've discovered, and, and, and again, my sound objectives for what I do, which is primarily weddings... And I do quinceañeras and things like that. And sometimes I do a school dance, and that's a very different sound objective. Yep. But for, for the weddings and, and quinceas, it's a social event. People want to talk. I want it nice and warm on the dance floor and, and hot, like a hot spot. But anywhere off the dance floor, you should be able to have a conversation with somebody. You should be able to hear the songs. You should be able to hear the announcements. But it shouldn't be the thing that is like there in your face it's that frequency i think with with the mid you know which is vocal mm -hmm. you don't want to occupy that frequency with your sound system in conversation areas you want people to be able to have those conversations and i feel like that 
the evolves that I'm using, whether the 50 or the 30 M really accomplish the objective of being able to hear it yet, not overpowering uh, that frequency anywhere in the room. And it works and, yeah. and, and people stick around and they have conversations and no one is saying it's not loud enough. Mm-hmm. No one says that ever. But again, my sound objectives, if you want to do a high school, which I've done two recently. Yeah. I'm, I'm going for bigger stuff. Yeah. I'm going for EKX. I mean, ETX would be even better, you know, but I'm trying to fill a room with, you know, several hundred kids. For social events like this, yeah, I, I like to keep that hot spot on the dance floor and then, you know, just listening at a very moderate level everywhere else in the room so we can have conversations. And for those of you wondering why we're kind of digging into this in this particular area is that we have a lot of questions when it comes to the the array type systems that mm-hmm. are out there and specifically the Evolve because people have mm-hmm. seen Brian using the 30 and, and I've had some video or, and pictures of those in the field. And these are questions and concerns that a lot of DJs have had. So that's why I wanted to spend just a little bit of time and kind of break out of Brian's story and tangent into this, because this is right. real world experience using yeah. using the gear. Um, it, and it it has its its uh, things it can do, and it has things that it can't do. And that's right. So right. that's why it, it's not it's not the Swiss Army knife. Yeah, it's really not. I mean, I feel like if you really want a Swiss Army knife, you're going to need a two way top cabinet. Like an EKX system is probably ideal. You can do 150 person event with it. You can do a 500 person event with it. <laughs> yep. Uh, but if you're specializing or doing primarily smaller events and more social events, then it, it I mean, it's wonderful. Yeah. They, and for a guy like me with my physical disabilities, it's incredibly easy because the way is good and the setup is easy. And they're very user friendly when it comes to that. So yeah. That's very. for sure. That's for sure. Well, let's jump back into the to the story. So you were okay. they brought you in uh, to you put the system together. You designed it. It looks very similar to yours. I um, yeah, I designed it. Then I built it. Yeah, and then they asked me to to go out and do some training on it in St. Louis. So I went there. I guess it was the week before last. Really, my brain is scrambled eggs. I can't remember what I've done when, but I went down there and and I attempted to show some people what I had done and they looked at it like it was, you know, the Star Trek. It just was science fiction to them. So then I was asked to go be a tech on the road and and train on the road. So go down there and just stand over whoever they have there, show them how to do things. And if they screw it up, you know, go twist the knob or whatever you got to do to make it happen. And if you need to step in and, and do it, the rest of the time you just sit on a stool, you know, it's going to be long days. It's going to be uh, at least 10 hour days plus, you know, you're there early, you're setting up and you're getting out of there. So altogether, probably good 12 hour days, solid 12 hour days, maybe more. 12 is a conservative estimate on that. Um, that was what I was planning on doing at Daytona Beach. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I went down there and the long story short, I ended up doing everything. I ended up performing I was standing all day. I was hosting the karaoke. I was teching things out. There were things. I don't know what you want to call them. I guess things that you couldn't possibly know unknowns that were going to come up on site, like the sun and the speaker placement and volume and a lot of things. There was a lot of problem solving on the fly on the tech side of things that I'm really glad that I was there to help out with. And then there was also the performance side of things. There were things to, to figure out with, with people coming in to sing songs. How are we going to do this? I had Jimmy De Palma make me this really cool sheet of, believe it or not, 50 tracks that we chose to use at the show. Only 50. People say that's not a lot, but you know what? We did, well, I got to back up a little bit. I only played band breaks. I didn't play when there was a band on stage because there were like four or five stages there. We were right next to the Sirius XM Octane stage. I've got people like Rob Zombie and Slipknot next to me. I can't compete with their sound system. Not so much. Yeah. I mean, the Evolve 30s are wonderful, but give me a break. You know. Plus, I want to you know respect to the artists. Let's not play over them. 
so we weren't playing when the band was playing mm -hmm. ultimately. So it was just band breaks yet. We still had between probably 40 and 60 performers a day with those 50 tracks. The way we did it was really cool. One of the spokes models there actually would ask people if they wanted to do it. If they said yes, she would sign them up, get their name, find out what track they wanted and give it to me. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have to do all that. Someone sure. else did that. They would just hand me the sheet. I'd load the track. We do a mic check with them and away we went. It was really nice. So we got a good rhythm down and it took a couple days to get there, mm -hmm. but the last two days were really smooth. We had the sound system where we wanted it. We had everything just, just dialed. It was good. Nice. It was real good. And there were a lot, so many unknowns. I mean, again, y you don't know where the sun's going to come in yeah. and what effect that's going to have on your equipment or your computer screen. And it's Florida sun, you know, it's hot. Mm -hmm. Even if it's not hot out, that sun just is closer to you than it is here in Wisconsin. <laughs> Especially at this time of the year. Yeah. Well, it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, it could be like 69 degrees out. The sun's out. It's baking your stuff if mm -hmm. it's on it. So it, there, there, was, there was a lot going on. And, and there were a lot of things that, that I discovered out there uh, just doing this that were kind of unforeseen, but. I mean, I've got the tech hat, I've got the DJ hat. So those, both of those things helped a lot. For instance, the plan that they ultimately had was that they were going to play the Spotify list of tracks off of an iPad mm -hmm. or an iPod, whatever, I something, when there was no one singing. So like the buffer music was going to be this playlist spotify uh, yeah. playlist yeah you know and the the list consisted of artists that were performing there at the the music festival so who was there metallica chevelle like i mentioned slipknot rob zombie i'm sure some of you heard about uh brass against i don't know if you heard that story or not Look it up when we get offline. Okay. I don't want to talk about it here, but there was an incident that made national news that happened at Welcome to Rockville with Brass Against. It involved a woman and uh, who was the lead singer who uh, basically didn't have time to relieve herself before the performance, apparently. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Well, just, just <laughs> look it up. Look it up. What it, you, you're not going to believe it. Oh, you're boy. Yeah. Not I, I, just, it. I just did the... the the little search for it and just seeing the yeah. headlines that pop up there's there's video it's bizarre oh, boy. it's very bizarre but i i didn't witness any of that that stage was not next to me i was next to the octane stage so i didn't know about it until today <laughs> until i saw the <laughs> headline <laughs> but that happened at welcome to rockville oh, okay. so many bands uh but anyway they were they were putting together a list and you would think going into this that that would make perfect sense. It's relevant to what's happening at the festival. But, you know, I, I think it's just like any other event that you do, be it a wedding or a quince or any event. There's a vision at the beginning mm -hmm. where it's like, hey, we think this is what we want. And then you say in your mind, hey, I think this will go over well. But then you get there. And it's different. It's not what you think. Mm hmm. I was talking to the, I, I guess you would call him the stage manager, who's from Milwaukee. Good guy. We were playing almost the opposite of what the stage was playing. And as people were walking by, because th there was a big walking path right in front of us, kind of going between the two main stages. Okay. So let's say you have, I don't know, you've got offspring playing here and they end at 7 15 over on the next stage you've got stained that's going on at 7 30 so there's 15 minutes to get back and forth between stages so there's a lot of traffic during those times i would watch the crowd walking back and forth and i would play songs to see what they responded to now like everything else and i think it, uh, for that it was much for the we had sure a little slow and sound quality yeah. 
where I'm playing the promo only uh, tracks, the Top Pitch USA tracks. They're they're good for broadcast. They sound good to the system. They're fun, and people take notice. Mm-hmm. So uh, that that was a discovery that I made. You know, although Apple Festival essentially, those tracks worked well. What kind of an audience uh, were they catering to with this event? Well, it, it's rock, and. It was funny because, like I said, you've got artists like this this Rise Against. You've got artists like Anthrax. They were there. But then you also had Leonard Skinner. So there you had all kinds of people from all walks of life there. You had people just like rock. You had people who were really into the head stuff. You had people who I think were just casual concert goers. But, I mean, as you know, there are a lot of people out there who do enjoy rock, but they like other things, too. We know this from going to weddings and things there are people who, you know how many grooms have you talked to who's like yeah i'm a rock and roll guy mm-hmm. but then turns out you know they'll they'll dance to other things and they enjoy those things so i, I don't think it's it's as um cut and dry as we we think it is on paper P- people are, are a little more fluid than that when it comes to musical tastes sure so it was all kind really were all kinds of people there uh, so people there you know in costume you know, like cosplay people. Yeah. And then there were just like normal dudes there. And there were girls there, groups of girls there. They were black. They were white. They were Latino. They were all walks of life, you mm-hmm. know? Hmm. So all kinds of people. I, I will say that it was a really good crowd. Nice. There were no issues. Everybody was cool. Everybody was nice. Nobody got weird. The, I, I didn't notice at any point in time where anybody was what I would consider misbehaving. You know, aside from some s- rather strange aromas in the air, which you will have at a concert, <laughs> uh, everybody was just being cool. You know, there was no problem. So, <laughs> strange aromas. Yeah. yeah. Hashtag contact high. It's, it's a thing. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So, so you ended up performing for the whole and, and yeah. doing that. So those were mm-hmm. how... How long would the days end up? I don't think you've talked about the actual length of the day. Well, I would get there on site at around around 10, maybe 20 after 10, because it does take some time to park. It takes some time to get from the lot through the checkpoint and and into the infield of the Daytona 500, which is where this was held. Mm-hmm. There was in the Daytona 500. It's in the infield. That would take time. Then once you get in there, you got to set up. And they opened the gates around noon for people to come in. There were people camping there. There were campsites in the infield. People would bring their RVs and such. But they still would close off, you know, that area where the festival was actually happening and open those gates at noon. And then the, the latest I went was 1020. And the... Most of the time it was 10. Sunday I snuck out early because I could. It just worked out that way. I snuck out early. But yeah, I average about 10 o'clock every day. So by the time I, I got there, like I say, around 10 and then I'm leaving, I'm not really getting out of the lot until probably I would guess about a little after 1030. Pretty long days. Or 12, or it's a solid 12 hours altogether, I would say. Just so with how, everything else you have to do. How did you balance you know, having multiple long days traveling uh, and really kind of going and going and going for a couple of weeks with this? Mm-hmm. How did you take care of yourself so that you were still alive come Sunday, the last <laughs> day of this, the event? Well, road food is always scary. So I was really trying to eat light. That was That was a big thing. And if you know anything about me, you know that I drink a lot of coffee. I cut way back on the coffee intake. I drink it in the morning. Something else that I did was as soon as I got back, as soon as I left, if I wasn't grabbing coffee for the morning or a sandwich or something, I was going directly back to the room. I was turning on HBO Go, putting on a Sopranos episode, and usually asleep by midnight. I was up at probably somewhere between quarter after six and 6.30 every morning. And that's when I would kind of, you know, wake up slowly. I get cleaned up, shave, get dressed, 
you know, check any email I had or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And and maybe just relax a little bit and then head out the door about quarter to 10. Sure. So that that's how it worked. I didn't party with the guys. I don't know that they were even doing it. I, I don't know if the staff was partying. We were in different hotels, so I have no idea. I was all by myself. So yeah, it, it was work and sleep. Mm-hmm. That's what it was. Food, I, I just ate very light. It was a lot of cold cut sandwiches and things like that. One day I went through the Wendy's drive through I was hoping to get a grilled chicken sandwich and they didn't have any grilled chicken. I had to get the crispy chicken. That was bad. I, I should have done that. The other thing is when I eat, and I do this anyway, but I eat until I'm no longer hungry. I don't eat until my plate's gone. When I'm done eating, I'm done eating. Sure. If I overeat, that's bad. So I felt really good. You know, mm-hmm. it was good to, to do it like that. What I wish I would have done and going back uh, it probably would have would have helped a lot was to have a little OJ in the morning that probably would have helped that vitamin C. Sure. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I had coffee in the morning and they, they had a, like a Starbucks with a limited menu there at the hotel. So I was getting like, you know, cafe mochas or whatever in the morning. And, um, if I had a little leftover from my sandwich that I ate the day before, I might have that for breakfast, but I only eat when I was hungry, not when it was time to eat when I was hungry, I ate. And then I had you know, like little, you know, healthy snacks that I would eat. But yeah, it was, it was work and sleep. There was there was no extracurricular. I didn't see Daytona Beach, the beach at Daytona Beach. <laughs> I, there was no time. I I saw the hotel room and the speedway. That's what I saw. And uh, your two areas, and that was it. Yeah. Uh, so it's like quite an experience. Though would have been cool to to do, but I think if you would have known going into it all the what was going to happen and such, it might have been more stress on the front side than a person would have probably been comfortable with or liked well i don't know i don't know how you do it john but when i go into an event i think as as mobile djs we are almost conditioned to hope for the best but prepare for the worst so i always go into an event expecting just fire coming from the sky and earthquakes and hailstorms. that's just how i go into every event Mm -hmm. so if it isn't a complete catastrophe it's a win mm-hmm. and, and I'm ready for it you know. And it's like, Oh, this is nice. It's not as bad as I thought it would be. If you go in thinking, ah, oh, there's going to be a breeze and then something goes wrong. You're very flustered and it, it it's hard you. to, you know, get your bearings about yourself. Yeah. But yeah. Just be prepared for the worst thing that could possibly happen. And if it doesn't, it's a bonus. Yeah. That's good. Good words of advice there. Uh, let's jump into you. The, the idea that uh, they wanted you to come down and do some training uh, mm-hmm. with, with the gear, uh, not yeah. specifically just in this instance, but I wanted to talk a little bit because I, I do have another DJ coming up here in the family. I've got a seventh grader who's now starting to, to interest, uh, have interest in that. And I was thinking um, to train people, to show people how to do what we do. Yeah, if you had some, because you, know, you, you have done that, you've had many people where where you have been showing them and teaching them, tutor, tutoring them throughout the years. What has worked the best in your estimation when it comes to uh, showing and teaching someone the craft that we do? Well, all you can do, or all I've, I believe that you can do is teach people the technical part of the job. So this is your crossfader. You know, here are your 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 pre-fade listens. This is your DB. This is where you set your master. See what happens when you go to eight and your master is at eight and you're at zero DB on your pre-fade listen. Hey, look, everything's at zero DB. Yeah, so just make sure every track's like that. And and then just that's what you focus on. That's the big focus for me. Mm-hmm. When it comes to programming, hey, you're on your own. I, I can't I can show you what your paintbrushes are and what a canvas is but i and a couple techniques but but above and beyond that you're an artist you have to develop your own artistic thing that you do Mm -hmm. Uh, i can't tell you what to play but i can show you how to play things and and show you how the technical stuff of it works so you know i tried to make that as simplistic as possible as possible Mm -hmm. (laughs) okay do you think do you think that DJs that are get, wanting to get into this, do you think they struggle more with the technical side of it? Or do you think that it's the 
what to play at the at what time to play it. Which what side do you think they struggle the most with? Well, from what I'm hearing, I think a lot of DJs feel like if they've got the technical part down, they're done. That's just the start. You need to to understand, you know, how to perform and and, and make this your own mm-hmm. and and come into your own as an artist. The technical part, I mean, that's just what you must do to make sound come out of speakers. <laughs> that's <laughs> yep. you know, it it I can show you that. And 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 I think that most people, especially can can we say young people? We can say that, right? Mm, certainly, that's not uh, your family, the young family, but, but young yeah, people. I mean, that's that's you know, younger DJs are the ones that I'm younger, right? Working with, yeah. I, I I think they're they're technically pretty good. I mm-hmm. mean, they grew up around technology and they seem to understand things. Whether or not they they follow the Unity gain system or the zero dB rule is is irrelevant. They usually don't. They like pretty lights bouncing around, and if they don't see, you know. So you're not headlining unless you're red. Is that what they say? Yeah, yeah, exactly. If you're something like that. Um, but anyway, I mean, I think they can learn the technical part, but but the the artistic part is is a little tricky, mm-hmm. as you know. I mean, you come into your own. It's interesting. I was talking to to Jay Brennan, like I do. He was telling me about this little dive bar he went to, this tiki dive bar in Vegas this week him and chris cox and i think i think cb sean some other guys went into this little dive bar and there was a a guy in there with turntables and he only played 45s he'd only been djing for four years and everything that he played he didn't know what the stuff was he'd found it in his garage that morning it was amazing stuff it was like rare groove stuff he Hmm. was just pulling tracks out and trying them and my understanding is the guys had the best time listening to this. Sure. What a, what a this, journey that would be. Yeah. He wasn't trying to beat mix it. He, no, no, he was just playing the songs. So the only song you recognize was like a Daft Punk sample. And we figured out that it was um, released the, the beast by breakwater from robot rock. Like he had the original, you know, there, there and there, but nothing else they recognized. And they said it was the most amazing thing. It was so much fun. I don't know. I mean, that's cool to me. Mm-hmm. When someone's trying to impress, I think that's, I don't know. For, for the younger guys, I, they're trying to impress with mixing skills. They're trying to impress with, I don't know, that they're so cool, you know. I, I, I don't know. I think it's, it's better when, when you don't know. <laughs> this poor guy in there, he didn't know enough about DJing to know what he was doing. And it was amazing. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it, but I know what he's talking about. Yep. You've been to my house. There's bars across the street from me. There was a bar across the street from me. It's Blackbird now, but it used to be called Groove. And on the side of the building, there there was a big sign that looked like a Technics 1200 turntable. And they had guys in there that would do that. They would show up with their 45 collection. I just play the weirdest stuff and it was so much fun. That's cool. I mean, that's like programming by mistake, like mm-hmm. great programming by mistake, but they were pulling it off. Then there's the whole factor where you need to learn what people like and what, what motivates them. And it's just like, I was talking about this rock festival. I mean, I was talking to Jay about this and he's like, oh man, let's, let's get a list of metal tracks that you're going to want to play. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. I better pay attention to this because mm-hmm. that's what we thought it was going to be. Right. But once you're there, you see, no, wait a minute, let's try something different. I mm-hmm. think this might work better. And it does. Yeah. That's a hard thing to teach people. You can't, they mm-hmm. almost have to watch and pay attention to, to learn that the technical side, I think is. It can be taught, and that's what you can teach. But but the performance side, that's it's an art. So the the ability to look at that crowd down at uh, Daytona mm-hmm. was that something that you think you would have honed more over your years as a mobile DJ or your years yeah. that working as a club DJ or when you're doing both, that? both. I mean, they're all it's all relevant. Mm-hmm. It's what motivates people. It doesn't matter who they are, where they are. It's motivation. I could take more liberties to this than I could 
at a wedding. Certainly. Yeah, I'd like to do that. Or at a club, quite frankly. Yeah. Because it was mostly background stuff. Mm-hmm. So I could play. I really had no limits as to what I could do. Whatever I thought I could play to make people take notice and say, hey, what's going on in there? And bob their head a little bit. I'd play it. I didn't, I didn't have anybody telling me, oh, you must play this or you must yep. play that or we don't want to hear this and we don't want any of that. Um, I just went with it. So, yeah. But I will say this. I'm stopping and starting constantly, right? Because I'm doing the band breaks. Plus, there's people coming up singing karaoke. So you're stopping for them. You're playing their karaoke track and then maybe you're jumping back into a track. Probably not because typically I had several singers lined up. Mm-hmm. But after a couple of days of that, your brain is just scrambled eggs, dude. <laughs> I mean, I, I was just like, oh, my God, where do I go now? Because I was, I was attempting a no repeat. Okay. For the staff's sake. Mm-hmm. That's a club habit that I yes, got into. It is. Yep. You know, when you're playing, you, you know, you've done it, mm-hmm. played bars and things. You don't want to play the same songs all the time because then they, they know what you're going to play. You're predictable and they hate you. Yep. So you want to mix it up. So I made it a mission to do a no repeat week. And I don't think I repeated anything at all. But with all the stopping and starting, that's the hard part. Once you get momentum, it's easy. Oh, certainly. Yeah. It's like I was compared to pushing a, a stalled car. It's always hard to get the car rolling, but once it's rolling, it's not too bad. But if you had to constantly stop and get the car rolling again, it's going to get exhausting. So I was just shot. In fact, I went so far as to uh, Google on my tablet in the hotel room. I think it was Sunday morning. You know, great party tracks. And then I was like <laughs> taking pictures of these things with my phone. Oh, yeah, that song. Oh, yeah, that song. I haven't played that song. Because I just couldn't think anymore. I was so, well, I was tired. Uh, you know, just work, you know, great or work, I guess. And, and then, you know, wh- wh- where do you go? I always start out with my best tracks. Mm-hmm. And that's a habit that I got into a couple of years ago when I heard Louis C.K. say he starts with his best joke. He used to save it for last, but now he does it first because it forces him to do amazing things after that. Certainly. So I do that with tracks too. I, I The first day, oh man, I murdered it. Second day was Spotify, so I didn't have to do anything. And then the third day came along. I was like, okay, what did I do on Thursday? Okay, let's do something else. But by Sunday, I was like, I have no idea what to play. I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. But yeah, we worked it out. It, it went fine. And there were so many people singing karaoke. I wasn't really DJing as much as you'd think. Sure. Some in the morning... Uh, you start out doing it usually between band breaks. Sometimes by the time we got to a band break, the, the spokes models there would say, Hey, I've got three people lined up. Okay, well, let's just do this. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't even play any music. I would just jump right into that and do the hosting and, and mic teching and wonderful singing. There's a list of 50 songs out there that I never want to hear again. <laughs> <laughs> Um, these songs are never, never again. <laughs> there were a couple on the list that no one sang. It was kind of weird, but not many. Like, like there's like maybe three songs that no one sang, but mm. the rest of them, everybody hit them. Everyone at one point in time. Yeah. Oh, funny. Uh, we've got about 10 more minutes here before Howie's going to be getting, uh, getting things ready to go uh, for the, the uh, next show. I wanted yep. to talk about, Festivus was what I the kind of the my little topic of this this part of it. Yeah. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, Festivus is was an actual event that I think I think in the 1960s, um, a gentleman created the whole concept of having a Festivus celebration, and it became a big thing in um, in Seinfeld episode where um, where where uh, George's uh, father was supposed to be the one who created Festivus, but it actually was a thing before before uh, Seinfeld. But it was a celebration, Festivus for the rest of us. Instead of being the commercialism of Christmas, it was Festivus for the rest of us, celebrated on December 23rd. Why this is why this comes in is, Brian, I've had a few people who have, have looked at, you know, DJ Collective is going on right now. Um, some of the other conventions are out there, and people are like, we, we love, you know, we want to get to do these get-togethers and go to these conventions and things. But some of them are really, they're, they're the investment is there because they're going there for the educational side of it. 
and people are like, I don't really want to do something like that. They're like, we should do a Festivus DJ get together. I can, I can, you know, a, a gathering for the rest of us. So, right. and I, and you, you and I've talked about a little bit about this, um, you sure. know, of doing. You're something. putting me on the spot here, John. I, I this know. Is well, we usually talk on the phone about. Well, I wanted to. I wanted to throw this out there because there's going to be there might be yeah. some people out there, but is there? Do you think there's there there would be interest in doing something like that out there? Yeah, of course there would be. I mean, have we have we been hearing from enough enough folks who say, hey, you know, we would like to do a gathering, and and you know, where does something like this? go you know where do we, where does a person do something like this it, and, and i it doesn't matter and that that's the beautiful part about it and i know this because i've done it the the very first practice and enjoy event that i did in 2008 i think i had three weeks to plan it oh my it was in january in wisconsin in fact it was the first time you and i ever communicated i remember you sending me an email now, i'm john young i have the shocking news I'm, I want to come down and cover your your event that you're having. And at the time, I'm thinking, you know, look, I don't want to waste your time because I have no idea how many people are going to come to this. Mm -hmm. I had 100 people. I mean, how many events have you been to in the last few years where there haven't been 100 people? And precisely. Good events. I had 100 people. Yeah. I had been on YouTube for less than a year. I announced this. I got 100 people. They came from everywhere. They flew in from everywhere. We did a two-day event. It was relaxed and groovy. It was DJs helping other DJs. It cost nothing. We didn't charge anybody anything. Uh, if you build it, they will come if you do it right. And what I've noticed is I, I appreciate all of the show producers out there, what they're trying to do and what they've done, but it's always the same thing. It's like we have a list of people lecturing and then we have some gear and be on your way. I think you can do things that are a lot more fun than that. You can do interactive things, mm -hmm. workshops, like real hands-on workshops and just, just time to talk the chill lounge. I mean, what did that turn into that turned into this zoom meeting that's been going on for almost yeah. two years now. Yeah, for sure. I mean, those are the kind of things people want to do. They want to learn from each other. And and I, I think that would be a fantastic, I guess, uh, maybe baseline to think about for something like this. Mm -hmm. Be different. It's just like I was talking about with the music at Welcome to Rockville. Yeah, we had these playlists set up with every artist that was on those stages. But when I played Michael Jackson, Billy Jean, that's when people turned around <laughs> and looked at me and said, what's going on in there? I want to be a part of that. It's different. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you got to just be different to be noticed. And people like different. Sure. So I don't know. Th those are just some off the hat. Two yeah. Cents. And that's, that's really kind of what I was, I was wanting to, to do is, is just to, you know, throw the throw the idea out there because there's there's folks out there who have brought this up. Uh, some of a couple of that are in the uh, ch chat room uh, with us tonight. But there's a lot of uh, there's been a lot of discussion. You know, because they've some remember back to the pra early practice and enjoy events you did, and some were mm -hmm. you know when we did our conclave um, when we got together in Minneapolis and mm -hmm. and had some good times uh, good times with that. So it's like you know, are we getting to the point where we're having that? Uh, and and this isn't a it, education where it's going to be speakers on a stage type of a, a gathering this would be right different than what is out there right now because th for the people who can learn in that setting and thrive in that setting there's some great content between you know february or or you know, april uh june and yeah so there's great stuff out there but there's there's also for some people who just want to come in and probably go the closest to that in the last few years was what uh, what Owen did really where yeah. we got to do get together and yeah there was some some t uh, seminars going on but it was a really, lot of seminars going there on. was a, there was also the informal aspect of it and maybe it wasn't supposed to be informal in the back rows but it was for us it was yeah. <laughs> it was for us it was um, but that was it was a good a good time and I just I've, I've wondered about that and as people have been bringing that uh, that up and such it's like hmm maybe it's time to uh, to look at that and see if uh, you know at some time later in 2022 uh, if we should be uh, planning another practice in I joy. think so. I think so. I mean, okay. And it's odd that DJs do this. It's odd that DJs have these 
structured lecture times and schedules and every single every single dj conference that i've been to does the same thing and they all tell you how different they are but they're really no different than the next guy they're doing the same stuff it's weird it's a but, similar formula yeah of what they're doing they yeah be, it's, it's all kind of the same formula it's the same outline yeah and you know they might be in plugging essence, in different people and and you know some have more better right more professional I mean, speakers some don't but yeah, it's like, okay, so we take a, a little bit of an exhibit hall, we take a, a stage full of speakers going up. I mean, and, and we've done that too. We, the Disc Jockey News, we did seminars and conventions around the country also. So it's right. not, but it, it's- as, yeah. a, as a DJ though, I mean, there's one thing that I can tell you, and, and this comes from my family. I learned this from my family and my family is not unique in this regard. You don't have to put on a dog and pony show to entertain people. All you have to do is get the right people in the room. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter what room it is, and they're going to have fun. I remember my sister said one time about my Uncle Dave. If anybody knows who my Uncle Dave is, he's not with us anymore, but he was quite a character. Mm -hmm. Uncle Dave could have fun in a cemetery. If he had an audience, it would be fun there. It didn't matter where Uncle Dave was. He brought the party with him. People are like that. Sure. DJ should be like that. So I don't think you have to put on these dog and pony shows for them. Just give them a place to be, to gather, and it's going to be fine. Our events are like that. Oh, you did such a great job. It's like, well, thank you. But you know what? You had a great audience. And that helps. Your yeah. guests were fantastic. Mm -hmm. They were self-starters. They were, they were ready to have fun. I think that we have those personalities as DJs where we don't really have to. We don't have to be in Vegas. We don't have... Dude, we could do this crap in Milwaukee. We've done it. We we could do it anywhere. We're in Boise, Idaho. I've never been there. Let's do it there. I don't know. <laughs> Sounds like a nice city. Let's yeah. let's go there. I, it doesn't matter to me. I mean, I did it here because I was at the time. It was you know that was a long time ago, mm -hmm. but at the time I had access to some people who had some venues that would go ahead and open their doors to me, and and I told them, hey, look, you can have bar. I'm just going to bring you. I don't know, hopefully 30 people on a dumb night where you'd have nothing else going on. And they were happy to open their doors. Sure. And I brought more than hundred people. They made money, didn't cost anybody anything. It was nice. Mm -hmm. That's why I did it here. Cause I, I just knew people, but yeah, you could do it anywhere. You don't have to make it as this exotic destination. Just say, Hey, look, who's going to be there? Well, Jay's going to be there. Brian's going to be there. John's going to be there. How he's going to be there get the right players there and they'll come and just to hang out with you, mm -hmm. you know? And there's nothing wrong with saying, Hey, you know what we're going to do? If it's a two day thing at five o'clock on this day, you know, John Young's going to tell us uh, how to incorporate a, a slide whistles into your DJ performances. That's going to be, Which a, I, he's going to do as a keynote at, at five o'clock on this day. You could do that, but if you do the whole day like that, it kind of sucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because after Telling people when to eat lunch and everything else, it's crap. After I've shown this slide whistle technique a couple of times, it would get old. It, it would. would be good, but it would get old. It would be good, but one time, five o'clock slide whistle, not all day of slide yeah, whistle presentation. Yeah, that's true. Although maybe if I would try to translate it to different languages, that could be exciting. Do it in Japanese. Ooh, I'll work on that. So that it's just something I wanted to kind of throw that that thought out there and just to plant the seed and and we'll have to revisit this and and talk about it more. Uh, I'm down, that. dude. But uh, as long as I'm not at some festival hosting karaoke, there is that. I'm down. <laughs> there is that. Uh, <laughs> this could be a thing. I don't know. Yeah. Well, uh, could, this could be it. It could be over. But I, it could also be my new career. I don't know. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens with that. So so yeah, we'll we'll look at uh, look at. Uh, Th this idea and we'll revisit yeah. that and do Let's you guys have any it. thoughts on that you know reach out to brian and myself or you know in the chill room you guys can chat about that and and uh who knows if it, if something could come together it'd be a lot of fun to get together and and uh spend a couple of days together uh, talking shop and just uh enjoying life i think it would be fun too it would be so uh, Brian, we're at the we're at a uh, uh, fifty past, so we got to get uh, things shut down and then head over to djntv.com/slash/chill. I think Howie's going to be headed over there in just a few minutes. 
Yeah, yeah. I have a show to do there. Yeah. You guys, Howie's my engineer. Yeah, Howie takes care of it and does a nice job. Producer. Keeping... That's why I've been calling him. That's kind of what he is, isn't it? it exactly. Yeah, it's a, yeah. exactly what he is, and he's been doing a great job. And I thank Howie for for all the time he's been putting into uh, doing our, our uh, shows in the evening like that. That is yeah, absolutely sir. fabulous. He does really well for, for an 87-year-old man. <laughs> I'm really impressed with his <laughs> <laughs> with yeah. what he can do and now you're gonna inspiring get, now you're gonna get cut off when he gets oh sorry brian because <laughs> you know he does have that ability to mute your microphone at any time yeah yeah uh, he yeah. does so uh thank you guys for being with us tonight hopefully you uh, had a, a a good uh time as we kind of went through a variety of different topics and thoughts tonight uh, jump over to djntv.com slash chill and join the guys tonight in the chill room and we will catch you next time good night everybody Oh, <laughs>